Legend of Keepers is a course setting adventure book written by Scott Taylor and in collaboration with iDemo Games, Lazy Squire Games, and licensed by Goblin Studios, creators of the original video game that inspired this book, Legend of Keepers Career of a Dungeon Master for PC and Mac. This setting and adventure book will run over 350 pages and come with over 100 3D printable miniatures designed to complement the game. Just like the original video game, the thrust of this book is that it puts you in the shoes of the monsters who reside in and administer the dungeons which heroes tend to invade and plunder. You're defending your dungeon room by room, controlling the normal panoply of monsters that you would otherwise be fighting against in a dungeon delve. The rule set that the adventures are keyed to is 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, which is now, you know, the people's rule set. There are a couple of things I want to point out about this video before we jump in. First, the creators did sponsor this overview, but did not have any say or direction in what to cover or what to say. As always, I'll go over the materials that I was given and then give my honest opinion at the end of the video. In this case, I'll share what I think are the greatest possible strengths and the biggest questions I have about the project. I say possible and questions because at the time of this recording, Legend of Keepers is being crowdfunded on Kickstarter. And that brings me to point number two about this video. I am only covering the 30 page preview document that was provided to me as the 350 plus page book is not available at the time of recording. We'll go through the whole thing together here and I'll leave a link at the top of the description below if you want to hop over to their Kickstarter page and pledge. So let's jump in and see what the preview document says about this game. All right, world history time. Apparently it's 1499 of the Great Clockmaker. The old empire has collapsed and the many independent states now encourage adventurers to raid all remaining dungeons and plunder them for the glory of a new god. Here's where things get really interesting really quickly. This paragraph right here. Quote, the best or at least the smartest masters, as in high intelligence monsters, join guilds such as the Dungeon Company. Thanks to guild services of interdimensional portals and mutual health insurance, the masters can optimize their yields. That right there tells you the tone of the game. It's like a mix of medieval fantasy and tongue-in-cheek modern capitalism. The setting shows the four dungeon locations that we aren't actually going to get to see in the preview, but which are billed as the big four dungeons that you'll get with the book. They're described as, quote, four epic customizable dungeons with infinite replayability, which would be really cool if it were the case. That remains to be seen. But as far as the four dungeon themes, you have Skullland, an icy wasteland with giant monsters and living dead who are refugees from a religious persecution. Then you have the Old Empire, presumably a standard fantasy theme with feudal and warring states. The Heady Valley, a tropical zone filled with dozens of dead and buried empires with possible influence from Central and South American civilizations of the past. And the Nacra Delta, a desert zone with more ancient ruins and spotted with lush gardens and pockets of civilization. I'm not sure if the pagan cults and religions named here will have any mechanical bearing on the game, but they certainly flesh out the setting aspect. Golthor is a mid-level demon of destruction. Techno Golthor is a machine version of Golthor from the future. Grandmother of the Hypogeum is a fey mother nature type of entity worshipped by dryads and fiercely protective of all plant life. Sawyers are elves who have split from those dryads and basically become loggers. Fellowship of the Mages is a meritocratic order of magic users who value intelligence as much as coming off as mysterious as possible to each other. And finally, the Logical God, which is described more as a philosophy that hails reason as its cardinal value, but whose followers have swept across the land and purged monsters and pagans almost as if they were a fanatical religion. There are four main dungeon factions mentioned here, and again, I'm not sure how they connect to the mechanics of the game. You have the General Confederation of Brawl, which can only be described as a labor union for monsters, the Dungeon Corp, a really ruthless ultra-capitalist investment company that churns through its own monster employees to make profit, Green Dungeon, which it says here specializes in restoring abandoned dungeons. It goes on to say that they are only now finding themselves having to participate in the dirty business of defending against invading adventurers. And finally, Dungeon Company, a sort of neutral alignment monster business that seeks a balance between profit and stability. 
So not having played the video game, I can only assume that these four factions are ones that you choose as a player and that affects your abilities and resources throughout the play cycle. Now, how that translates to 5e rules, I don't know yet, but I'm very curious to see what they do with these factions. Famous dungeon company bosses. So there are these three profiles here of high powered NPCs. You have a corporate Cyclops manager lady, an actual God who has been resurrected after a thousand years, and a really powerful shaman. I think these are examples of high level monsters that you get to control in the event that adventurers penetrate your dungeon deep enough that you're falling back on your last and best defenses. We don't get any stats in the preview here though. Okay, so running the campaign, it goes like this. There is a single objective, stop the hero party from conquering your labyrinth or dungeon and taking your treasure room. The way it plays out is that you must fight against the heroes room by room. The GM runs the hero party, so they're juggling a bunch of what are normally considered PCs, while you, the player, manage the monsters. It's why the game is billed as a reverse dungeon. In this game, the heroes are literally the evil ones. Your monsters just work here. It actually admits up here that a GM running a party of six PCs, or I guess technically NPCs, but statted as complexly as a 5e PC, is the most difficult part of the whole proposition. They suggest maybe having two GMs run this thing, splitting the six hero NPCs into two groups of three to manage. Any way you choose to manage it, the heroes heal up to half their HP total between each room, and once per dungeon, nab a long rest for a huge restoration of HP. There's some more information on the four dungeons here that will be included in the book. They are organized by hero levels, ranging from 2 to 10, which actually makes a lot of sense. If you're working with heroes in the 5e rule set anywhere over level 10, combat can get really draggy and the hero is just way too powerful. Here's something that I thought was really interesting. Treasure is very prescribed. Quote, each dungeon is considered to have 3,000 gold pieces and 200 tears and 200 blood. I don't know what those are in its treasury at the start of each crawl. Each time the hero party defeats, clears a room, the player will subtract 100 gold pieces from the treasure as well as take seven tears and seven blood. So there is a very distinct scoreboard being run here. Each time 10 rooms have been cleared by the adventurers, there is a request from upper management for a progress report from the dungeon bosses. And here you have some modifiers to a single D6 roll, and you get one of seven possibilities. The worst of which is you automatically lose a main boss that is currently stocked in your dungeon. And at the other end of possibilities, all non-monsters get a plus one to hit and plus one to damage. One of the biggest innovations that is revealed in this preview is the event deck card. They don't show all the cards that will be in the final deck, but you can see here the potential that this unlocks. Each time a room is cleared, a card is drawn. The card will either help the dungeon or it will help the heroes, and the card can be held in reserve or played immediately. I presume by the side which it helps. So for example, here in the items category, if the card Winged Boots is drawn, this is a dungeon card that helps players, so players can hold on to it until they want to put it into use. Cards can also represent events that can mix things up in pretty fun ways, like unexpected adventurers. Quote, one room is automatically cleared upon entry by heroes. Room can be any room, but can only clear non-boss monsters from that room. You can see how this becomes a bit of a board game, and these cards are an integral part of the strategy at play. So we do get a little taste of a part of one of the four dungeons here. The way these bosses, heroes, and special rules are listed, I think these features are randomly generated from tables, which is why they say these dungeons will be customizable and infinitely replayable, which is cool. I think that if they make dungeon generation tools that are robust, it could be a great tool that you can use in any setting, even outside of this game. Here we have a taste of what a few room descriptions might look like. Remember, it's the players controlling the monsters, so they would need to acquaint themselves with the monster stat blocks here and have a look at the rooms to work out some kind of strategy. As far as the hero party, there are some samples here on how they will be presented. If you're familiar with 5e, there's nothing here out of the ordinary. As I read through these, I did wonder how much of the backstory would really matter in the context of this game, but certainly the stats matter. And it is definitely true with the document mentions earlier that a GM juggling six of these characters is going to have their hands full. Interestingly, here's a level 13 hero. You can see how many play options there are with a character at this level. 
lots of features, traits, and spells. The preview ends with one tantalizing sample of a monster. The project boasts that there will be over 50 of these, and it's definitely one of the most important aspects of the project, since these are what the players will be controlling. All right, here are my thoughts on Keeper of Legends so far. Things I'm excited about. Playing as the dungeon managers in 5e. I've really been wanting to see this for a while. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Wicked Ones, a game I reviewed a while back where you play as a dungeon manager, also a game inspired by dungeon management video games, but Wicked Ones has its own rules fingerprint, being a heavily modified version of the Forged in the Dark rules. I've always wanted to see what Wicked Ones would be like using something like 5e, focused on detailed room-by-room -room combat. Simple proposition. As far as the game goes, I love the singular objective, which is always to stop the hero party from conquering your dungeon and taking the treasure room. And there's essentially a scoreboard running at all times, which I think could add some much needed clarity to a session. Artwork and presentation. From what I've seen in the preview document and images on the Kickstarter page, the art direction, artwork, and layout all look really top notch. That is always going to go a long way in my book. Event card deck will drive a lot of variety in play. The concept of drawing cards after each cleared room is pretty intriguing. Like I mentioned, it really adds a board gamey feel to the game, and I think that's a good thing. By defining the value landscape of the game, the author here is tightening the game experience and making the 5e rules focus on something that is clear to everyone at the table. Over 100 STLs. Personally, I'm a fan of 3D printing. I do a lot of it myself at home, and I really just enjoy where 3D printing for tabletop games has gone over the years. The amount of talent that you see these days in both terrain and miniatures is just astounding. And the work that Lazy Squire Games has done so far on the miniatures for this project are no exception. One of the coolest things about getting 3D printable files that are keyed to a particular game is that you can print as many of them as you want for what works out to be anywhere from 5 cents to maybe 40 cents for a huge miniature, depending on what material you're using. As long as you have a printer at home, you can make armies of these monsters on the cheap and even scale them up or down to your heart's desire. There were also three interesting features of the project that didn't come to light until after I recorded this, and I'm pretty keen to see how they turn out modular 3D dungeon tile terrain. Obviously, this is right up my alley, and I think they are going for a complete dungeon experience by providing the tiles here. Options for standard dungeon play. This would obviously involve turning the tables back around for GMs and players, but it's good that they added this as a fallback. And rules for PvP, which is something that can add even more dimension to the game experience. I do have three big questions about this project. How robust will the customizability and replayability of the four dungeons be? That's a big deal. If they stick the landing on those four dungeon generators, then there will indeed be a lot of replayability and therefore a lot of value in backing this project. And dungeons are the backbone of this whole operation, so I hope they get that right. How will the cults and religions and factions connect with the mechanics, if at all. I'm not at all sure how much connective tissue there is between the setting details and the gameplay itself. I love the hints at the satirical corporations and labor unions, and I'm hoping that they weave that humor into various aspects of the game so that it shows up in actual play. Will there be any optional rules or suggestions on how to lighten the GM's burden of running six full-blown PCs? This is a tricky one because if you start snipping away mechanics and play options on the hero party side, then you have to tinker with the options on the monster side as well. But there is the looming fear that this game would be hard to run for one GM, at least until the monsters kill off a few of those heroes and simplify things a bit. So yeah, that's my rundown of Legend of Keepers. I'm really interested in a lot of what this game is promising and really enthralled with the 3D models that are already being shown. Leave your thoughts and questions down in the comments, and of course, I've left a link to the Kickstarter where you can read more about the project and support it. Thanks for watching. See ya.